I am a tree-hugging dirt worshiper. <laughs> and I love to talk to garden clubs because the, your kindred spirits. I can talk about tree-hugging dirt worshipers and you understand what I'm talking about. So I wanted to talk to you this evening about composting. Uh, this is a subject that is near and dear to my heart. Uh, I've been composting for about 30 years now, probably a little bit longer. Um, I grew up in Brookfield on John's Road, which was named after my grandfather because it was part of the old farm. And I have very clear memories of my dad saying to neighbors, I remember walking behind a horse and plow over these fields. So some people say I have dirt in my veins. Probably, you opened up a vein, you might get a little dirt there. But I first started composting just to keep stuff out of the landfill. So one of the things we'll talk about this evening is the why of composting. But let's get started first and talk a little bit about soil health. And yes, this is my compost in the background here. Ooh, ah, it's really, I, it, it, that's one of the tests of a real gardener. You know, if you see good, healthy compost, ooh. If people don't go ooh when they see good, healthy compost, mm, I don't know if they're real gardeners or not. But when we're talking about soil health, so there's soil and there's soil. Not my kids, not my dogs. But what's taking place here, other than a lot of fun, is soil compaction. So soil is made up of a number of different things, and one of them is particles. Uh, the minerals are in particles. Gravel, we have an idea of how big gravel is. In this case, we're talking about tiny pea gravel. Sand particles, silt particles, and clay. So if you've ever done any work with soil science, sand, silt, and clay are the, the holy trinity, and it's getting a good balance between your particle sizes that gives you good quality loam for your soil. If you have soil that's too sandy, it drains instantaneously. If you have soil that is too clayey, it retains water like crazy. Good garden soil, good texture garden soil, by volume, approximately 35% minerals, approximately 15% organic matter. Anybody want to guess by volume what the other 50% is? Green, green material? No, no, that would be under organic matter. Somebody said over here. Air and water. Air and water. She's looking on the cheat sheet. <laughs> Air and water. It's important to have pore space in between those particles in the soil, in between your mineral particles, your organic matter. There's got to be movement space, air and water, because if the air and water can't flow through the soil, you know what else can't move through the soil? Plant roots. So those kids at the beginning who were playing in the mud having a grand time for themselves, that's cool as long as that's not going to be the garden later on in the year because they are compressing all of the pore space out of that soil that they're playing in. And if you get soil that's heavily compacted, you need a jackhammer to get through it to get a soil sample. Mm -hmm. If you've ever tried to dig a walkway or lay out a walkway in a spot that is sort of a path that's worn by the kids or the dogs or whichever, you know what I'm talking about when, when I'm talking about compacted soil. So if we can avoid compacting the soil, we're going to have much happier plant roots. Normal soil with that pore space between the particles, the water and the air can move through, <coughs> as can the plant roots. No moisture, no air, compacted soil. And this is what happens. If you've ever done any gardening in a spot that had been a farm in a, a previous lifespan, you'll encounter something that's known as the plow pan which is to say the compacted soil underneath the area that was how deep it used to get plowed. It would get plowed to a certain depth. Below that point, soil's totally compacted. So if you're not trying to grow foot-long carrots, then you can plow down six inches and you're good to go. But if you want those longer vegetables, if you want those deeper roots, it's going to be much more of a challenge 
if your soil is compacted. Much healthier plant if those roots can go wherever they want to. Not so healthy if the roots are stuck at a certain level. So if we add compost to organic matter, it's going to improve the structure of almost any soil, whether it's compacted or not. If you have sandy soil and you add compost to it, it's going to be better able to retain water. If you have clay soil and you add compost to it, it's going to drain better. It's sort of like when we take a fiber supplement. No matter what's going on with our bodies, it's going to make us a little bit healthier. So the, the compost is going to be a good thing. So here's your compacted soil. Here's your plow pan. And see the roots are coming down and they're going at an angle. And then we have over here much deeper tilth and much healthier roots on those corns, on the corn plants. FDR, this is really what caused the Dust Bowl in the Great Depression, is the fact that in Oklahoma, in that area of the world, the topsoil had been worked to death and it had not been properly tended, so it blew away. There was nothing left for the plants to hang on to. Add a little drought to that and you've got a recipe for disaster. So on to composting, our favorite thing here. What is composting? Rodale, which is the Bible of anything gardening. Biological reduction of organic wastes into humus. What? And the home compost pile is an intentional reproduction of this natural process. Blah, 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 blah. Isn't that a little dull? So let's just look at something and tell me what the common denominator is in all these pictures. This is a volcanic caldera on the big island in Hawaii. Swamp. Anybody who can tell me what these white things are on this tomato hornworm? Extra points. Close. Close. Bless you. It's, it's a parasite. Braconid wasp chrysalis. It's not technically the right term, but the wasp lays its eggs inside the bug. The babies eat the bug from the inside out. Yay, nature. <laughs> and the babies come out and they weave their little cocoons out here. And then they fly off, and make more wasps to parasitize more worms. So we've got that. We've got the forest floor. We have a little squishy spot in a river. We have another river. There's my husband. Hi, Terry. We have another forest floor. We have a meadow. What's the common denominator? Anything? Life and death. Life and death. Things are decomposing in all of these pictures. These rocks are breaking down into smaller rocks. These grasses are dying and feeding the soil. These leaves are dying and feeding the soil. It's a completely natural process. Composting has been taking place since the first thing died on this planet. It's not something that requires our intervention. We can intervene if we choose to. We can make the bins and we can do all the things. But it's not something that requires our intervention. So if you go away from this talk with nothing else, go away knowing that you can have the simplest compost operation in the world, and it's perfectly fine. So this is a commercial composting operation. This fellow is operating a windrow turner. He's turning this compost pile. It's sort of overcomplicating things, but if you have a commercial operation, you have to do what you have to do. So why do we compost? Why bother? The reason that I started composting, some of us remember the 1970s when this science came into being, garbology. Garbology, the heck is that? It's an offshoot of anthropology, archaeology, whereby people would do digs in dumps, in garbage dumps. 
and they would dig down. And you know, we all think about methane production in dumps and things decomposing and off-gassing and all this stuff. There are certain areas in landfills where there's enough moisture that this decomp is taking place, but not all areas of all landfills have enough moisture to decompose the stuff. And in the 1970s, the garbologists would do these digs in these dumps, and they would find vast areas where not only were they digging down deep enough and finding 50-year-old newspapers that were perfectly readable, but on the same levels, they were finding 50-year-old pieces of lettuce that were perfectly recognizable. Iceberg lettuce is 96% water. When I first got married, I thought, well, you know, I'm going to just send my stuff to the dump. It's going to add water to the dump, and it will help things break down. And then I read about the garbologists. And I said, plainly, my iceberg lettuce is not going to make enough of a difference to tip this scale. The problem is, if we go back to this little cycle here, all of these little things that are coming into play. There's a cycle of nature whereby if we take things and throw them in the dump, that cycle gets truncated. So food and paper account for about half of municipal solid wastes. If we could keep that stuff out of the dump, just on a household level, Think about how much of an impact we would have on the stuff get, that's getting thrown away. There's a terrific book that I brought over here. There's three books that I brought for show and tell. It's called Let It Rot. And this uh, fellow, Stu Campbell, went to a fellow in Florida who's sort of the king of composting. And this fellow, whose name escapes me, said, anything can be composted. And I'm thinking, refrigerators? What? What are you talking about? No, not. And Stu said to the guy, well, aren't there some things that just have to be thrown away? Mm -hmm. Greatest quote in the whole book, there's no such place as away. <laughs> we should be able to recycle or reuse or compost or whatever everything that we're utilizing. So it's something that we should be thinking about. And every little bit that we can do to shift that balance is going to help Mother Nature a lot. So here's the cycle of life and death. So you have your green plants coming up, and the herbivores are eating the green plants, and the carnivores are eating the herbivores. And all of these guys are going to die eventually, whether they get eaten by somebody else or not. So we have all this wonderful dead organic matter which feeds the decomposer organisms who also die and get eaten. And it all becomes nutrients which feeds the plants and so on and so on and so on. And if this dead matter gets truncated, these nutrients don't come back into the cycle. It's all in suspended animation in the dumps. So if we can do some composting at home, even a little bit, we don't have to have a big production. If we can keep some of the stuff out of the landfill, keep it in that natural cycle, we have the opportunity to actually feed the plants. The compost that we put on our gardens or on our lawns, it provides nutrients when and where the plants need them. You're feeding the soil rather than relying on man-made fertilizers. Think of it as the difference between a nice nutritious meal or Flintstone's chewable vitamins. You know, really, as far as fertilizers or vitamins or any of these things go, really what that boils down to is, this is the best science has done to date in figuring out what nutrients they are, synthesizing those nutrients, utilizing production and shipping and all of the other costs involved, sucking up natural resources to make these fertilizers, when in fact all we really have to do is use the compost. It's as simple or as complicated as you want it to be. It's just the right thing to do. Really, it's mostly simple. And it can be free. It's not something where you need 
giant production numbers. So let's talk about what goes into the compost. The compost books talk about greens and browns. It's not necessarily the colors that are going to come into play, but they're referring, greens refer to highly nitrogenous material and browns refer to highly carboniferous material. So let's talk about that a little bit. Greens, green plant clippings, green grass clippings, green vegetable scraps, those sorts of things. That's where the, the green connotation comes in. But other nitrogenous things, hair, coffee and tea, uh, crushed eggshells, they say that you should rinse your eggshells because you really don't want any protein in your compost pile. Couple of reasons that you don't want protein. Protein will break down perfectly fine, and it's really good nitrogen. Two problems with protein, it breaks down slowly, and it's gonna attract critters, because it's gonna break down stinky. A good compost pile really shouldn't have a stink to it. It should have a nice clean smell to it. Carboniferous material, straw, pine needles, some sawdust, don't get crazy on the sawdust, wood prunings, dryer lint. If you've got a load of just cotton or just wool, just natural materials, put the dryer lint in the compost. Nothing wrong with that. The fibers from the polyester or whatever that go into the lint trap, it's not going to harm your compost, but it's not really going to break down. So, you know, it's going to make for very stringy compost when everything else is broken down and we have stringy stuff in there. So it's, it'll be peculiar, but it probably won't be a crisis of epic proportion. Um, things like, I said with the sawdust, you want to be careful with sawdust. Um, there's a place over... Ah, I want to say near Rhinebeck, New York. My husband did some work there many years ago with a friend, and it was at a historic sawmill right by the side of a river, and I mean, like mill-like operated by water power kind of mill. And it had been in operation for decades up until the turn of the century. And of course, it's a sawmill. They have tons and tons and tons and tons and tons of sawdust. So. This is the 1800s, you just throw it over the hillside, who cares? So there was a giant pile of sawdust. It could be half the size of this building. My husband went over there and he said, I wonder how broken down this stuff is. He took a shovel, he dug the shovel in, there was about two inches of topsoil, the rest of it was pristine sawdust. There was no nitrogenous material mixed in with it, so there was nothing to start the process of the breakdown. At the edge, at the outer surface, there was an interaction with moisture and nitrogenous material, but that moisture couldn't seep in enough. It either evaporated or dissipated laterally. So that's what happens in the dumps, and that sawdust dump was a very clear example of it. Now, if you have a home compost system that is an enclosed container, one of the garbage can shaped compost systems, what's important to do is have some sort of a bin or a basket of browns next to it. So every time you bring your compost out from the kitchen, put some of this stuff on top of it. You want to make sure you're layering your browns and your greens. If you can turn this stuff, that's fine. But again, not actually necessary. As long as you can get those layers in there. The nitrogen is what cooks. The browns, the, uh, the carboniferous material, is what provides the fuel for the cooking, if you will. So really, there's plenty of carbon in these things as well, but there's a lot more nitrogen. If you have only this stuff in the compost pile, you can easily get anaerobic decomposition. So anaerobic, no air. If there's anaerobic decomp, a couple of things take place. Uh, thing one, you get stink. Thing two, it's really slimy. It's not a really pretty picture. Uh, there's stuff, um, there's a, a, a special way of composting nowadays, it's called bokashi. Uh, I'm not completely familiar with it, but it's an enclosed system and it relies on anaerobic decomp. 
So it's kind of a vinegary uh, scented operation. It's, um, it's a completely different theory. So if it's something that's of interest to you, by all means do research on that. This is not Bokashi style composting. But it's a great place to get rid of your, your uh, paper from the office. You know, I try to recycle, print on two sides, that kind of thing. But once it's printed on two sides, what are you going to do with it? Shred it up, put it in the compost pile. If you leave it in sheets, again, you're not going to be able to get air between the sheets. It's going to have a hard time breaking down. But paper, cardboard, those things are terrific in the compost pile. Now, don't you feel smarter already? Yes. My compost has a lid on it. Should mm -hmm. I be putting the lid on it each time that I dump? Or I've been leaving it open, but I do have the lid. A lot of that is going to depend on how much rain we've had. So if you're in a, if you're in a really rainy spell, you're probably going to want to keep the lid on it to keep the excess rain out. That's one of the things you want to watch in your compost pile if you have an enclosed system like that, is the moisture level of your contents. If you've got a real dry spell like we've had this summer, you want to actively water your compost pile. They say that it should have the moisture level of a wrung out sponge. So in general, you know, you're not going to get too carried away with the, the specifics on it. But that's going to be the ballpark of what you're looking for. So having the lid on or off is going to be one of the ways to control the moisture level in it. Um, Outside of that, I mean, I'm a fan of just a big open throw it in the corner of the yard compost pile, which I will show you pictures of <laughs> later. So I, I'm, I'm the ultimate low tech compost person here. Um, so some higher tech compost things. There's this fabulous bin system with the uh, enclosed jobby up here. And then there's the, the supply of uh, brown stuff to layer in here when they bring the, the household uh, scraps out and then they've got the clean out at the bottom of it and so that's all the done compost that they have sieved before they put it in here and then they can back their wheelbarrow up to it. This is Cadillac composting. <laughs> this, 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 is, this is sort of, this is the anti-Donna of composting. Uh, let's just say I do not own a compost thermometer. You are welcome to get a compost thermometer if so inclined, exactly. It looks like a meat thermometer, only it's this long. It's a little alarming. Yeah. The, <laughs> exactly, exactly. The whole thing with a hot compost pile is, so picture a hot compost pile, they say, is ideally three feet by three feet by three feet. So you're going to start off with the proper ratio of browns and greens layered in there. And what happens at first is the macro composters will start to break things down. Uh, earthworms, sow bugs, flies, flies putting their, lar their uh, eggs in there and the larvae hatch. So you've got the maggots, all of, all of the bugs that we recognize as bugs are in there and they're going to start the breakdown process. As the breakdown process begins, heat starts to come into play because all these creatures have got a certain amount of body heat that they're giving off. And their excretion, the stuff that they have composted, is coming out warm. So things are starting to warm up a little bit. As things start to warm up a little bit, the larger macro composters are going to say, whoo, too hot for me, hot flash, stepping out to the outer edges of things. Things are still warm, so the smaller composters are going to come into play the microorganisms that I don't even know the names of, but the little guys that are really comfortable at the higher temperatures. So the center of a hot compost pile can be between 140 and 160 degrees. So we've all seen, if you've driven by the uh, large commercial uh, mulch companies, and we've seen those mountains of mulch in the wintertime or on a foggy day, and they're steaming, it's because they're breaking down. They're decomposing in the center. It's hot in there, and they're starting to steam. And I don't know about you folks out here, but we actually have a commercial composting operation one town away from me up in New Milford. They've had fires up there. So, you know, they have to be real careful because they're dealing with very large-scale 
productions up there and it can become quite problematic. But if you are being a thermometer wielding composter, you're monitoring the center of your pile. And once it has peaked in its temperature and started to come down a little bit, that's when you're going out there with your pitchfork and you're turning the compost. Because the stuff at the edge hasn't gotten those micro uh, organisms involved in it yet. So you're getting the stuff that's all cooked in the middle, moving it toward the outside and getting the uncooked stuff, moving it toward the inside. Unless you're me, because <laughs> that's not what I do. Nuh-uh. Other ways of doing it, some folks will have the three bin system. So they'll have one bin that is actively receiving stuff, one bin that's in the process of being turned, and one bin that is finished and is going out into the garden. A couple of variations on that. I just really don't have time. You know, I'm going to spend my time playing in the garden with the plants. Mother Nature can do the work. Then you have the lower tech systems. You have bins made out of pallets. And gee whiz, if you let it sit there for a year or so, it composts all by itself. <laughs> Go figure. This person got all crazy and made it out of uh, hardware cloth. This thing in the center here is a compost turner. All right, so you've got a stick. You've got a handle on the top, and at the bottom, there's, uh, I don't even know what you would call them, little things on hinges. You can poke it down, and they're folded up, and then when you pull it out, it opens up, and it turns the stuff for you. Again, not my gig. Just not my idea of fun. Now, this guy is named Lee Reich, R-E-I-C-H. If you ever get to read any of his books, he writes some really good gardening books. He writes books on composting. He writes books on weedless gardening, all sorts of terrific things. He's an excellent writer. He spends way too much time monkeying with his compost, but that's OK. And he's got a lot of really good stuff. So this is a, a multi-bin system, but it's a little bit easier to deal with. He just takes them apart and puts them back together again at leisure. And he usually puts his compost bins right in the areas of the garden where he's going to be doing more stuff next year. So he doesn't have to truck it all over the countryside, which makes a great deal of sense to me. Lives right over in, uh, somewhere in the, not too far into New York State. Maybe as far as New Paltz, but not far at all. New Paltz, Newburgh, somewhere in the Hudson River Valley. But very interesting person. The, the tumblers that you can buy uh, makes it a little bit easier to turn the compost. Um, they're not bad. Some of them aren't designed terribly well, and you have to have a lot of strength to move them, so you want to really look carefully at them. This one seems to have some sort of a gear drive, so I think you'd probably be able to do it well. But again, she should maybe, you know, hiding over here, she should have a basket of brown stuff to be tossing in there when she puts her green stuff in there. Just a bin with a lid. This is very similar to the one from a few slides ago. Is that similar to what you have, Allison? Yeah. Same idea. Well, somebody gave it to me. I would never buy it. <laughs> so this is getting a little closer to what I'm down with. This is just, oh, look, I have a bunch of wire. I will wire it together and chuck stuff in it. <coughs> Not a bad idea. Not a bad idea. And notice, this is in the shade. Some people feel that you really have to have your compost in the sun. It will cook faster in the sun, but it's really not necessary. Again, stuff has been breaking down since the first thing died. It's going to manage to break down, even on the forest floor in the shade. Compost containers for the kitchen counter can be whatever you want. The sieve on top of the pot is an interesting idea. I like the old cookie jar. I will say one thing about containers for the kitchen counter. I don't recommend ceramic, glass, anything breakable, because you know what? When you take the compost out, you're going to want to go bang, 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 bang on the tree <laughs> or the edge of the bin or whatever to get all that stuff out of it. Do you want to bring it back in the house and rinse the compost container out? Mm. I want to get all of it outside. So I like the Hello Kitty shower cap look here, though. <laughs> that, that's quite something. This is a little more my speed. This is actually my compost from my kitchen counter. Mm -hmm. Ooh, ah. Uh, I have an old square Tupperware container. Um, you put corks in there? Hmm? You put corks in there? 
Warren House? Oh, heck yeah. Oh, heck yeah. It's take forever to break down. About a year and a half, two years. It's not horrible. If you want stuff to break down faster, you cut it up in smaller chunks. Now, you'll notice right here is a Q-tip. If you have the kind of Q-tips that have the cardboard sticks, put them in the compost. It's cotton and paper. Put it out there. Uh, nail clippings, hair from your hairbrush, any of that stuff. Put it in the compost. It's ready to go. So this is my compost pile. It's off in the woods. There's the brush pile back there. And here's my compost pile right here. The one downside of this location is that I get tree roots growing up into my compost. So when I go to dig some compost out, I have to fight with the tree roots. Oh well. Get a little closer look here. So obviously we've recently had a lot of corn on the cob in this picture. We've got a lot of corn husks here. This is the uh, compost pile in the wintertime. There's the pile right there. It's a couple of years ago. Now, I've had people say to me, well, what do you do with your compost in the winter? It's not going to decompose out there. True. Why can't you put your compost out in the snow? Well, but it's not going to break down. But you know what? The first day of spring, ta-da! <laughs> I'll tell you a story. So, you know, here's me doing compost lectures. My youngest brother is a geology professor at SUNY Oswego. And he called me, oh, it's got to be a couple of years ago now. And it was probably in January, February. And you think we get winter here? Let me tell you about up on Lake Ontario, OMG. He said, you're going to be so proud of me. I said, I'm already proud of you. He says, no, I finally got a composting operation in the kitchen in my building. He's like, I am proud of you. He's like, yeah, now I need your help. OK. I've got the kitchen saving the food. They're getting about five gallons a day of kitchen scraps. What should we do with them? <laughs> Dude, it's the dead of winter. He said, well, we've got an area where we want to do, like, you know, a, a composting system, but we don't have it built yet. I was like, honey, this could get ugly. Because here's what's going to happen. You're going to put this stuff in this area. Bin, no bin, isn't going to matter. It's going to build up fairly quickly because it's frozen. Ain't no breaking down right now. And no matter how diligent you are between now and springtime with layering in shredded paper from all the various departments, first day of spring, that's all going to thaw out. You're going to have about one day, and it's going to start to stink. <laughs> if you have a system in place already, keep adding to it. Don't start your composting in January, please. He was able to get something figured out. They had a place over by the maintenance building that they were able to put things. And I like little carts and horses thing here. But we finally got it all figured out. But I bring my compost out in the winter. There's my little trail. La, 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 la. Over on the other side of the fire pit. There's my compost in the dead of winter. There's a little pineapple top. Put it out there. I actually had someone say to me, Oh, I put my compost in the freezer all winter. Oh. <laughs> it's like, sweetie, I have a walk-in freezer. <laughs> it's right there. So you can compost your paper towels. You can compost your coffee filters. Don't be like my husband and leave the labels on the fruit. <laughs> Those aren't actually paper. There's oh, plastic. They're, they're, yeah. not paper. they're not paper. Those are plastic. Those labels are plastic. They don't decompose. Well, so they, like the Chiquita banana. The chi Chiquita banana. Yeah, so, so those labels need to go in the garbage. And uh, you know, they, they don't decompose terribly well. But you know, you'll notice all this compost right here. I just pulled this stuff aside a little bit. 
you don't have to dig down at all. You just scrape off that top layer and it's right there. More fabulous stuff. Partly broken down stuff, that's a much older pineapple top, much younger pineapple top. The compost right there. Now, I did an experiment. I got, wherever I was, I got one of those compostable plastic to-go cups. Three years. Three years, all it did was break. And I don't think that was from decomposition. I think that's from getting stuff thrown on top of it. So whether those things decompose in a municipal hot composting environment, I couldn't comment on that. Didn't work out so well in my cold composting home environment. So I think that was a failed experiment on that one, but it was worth a try. So this is my compost sieve. If you're gonna use your compost for your garden, for your lawn, I strongly recommend sifting it. This is just plain old half inch hardware cloth. My husband made a frame for me out of two by fours. The frame fits perfectly over my garden cart. Custom make it to go over your garden cart. You actually can buy these sieves in like, I'm sure Smith and Hawken has them, you know, the fancy pants places, but you don't have to go fancy pants with these things. Nice and simple, put it over the garden cart, put a few shovelfuls of stuff on it. It's gonna keep you from getting all the big chunks in there. Compost is great on your lawn. Put it in like a fertilizer spreader and just put it on the lawn anytime. If you're a lawn person and you use the Scott's 19 step whatever blah blah blah, try to wean yourself from that because anytime we put fertilizer, especially on our lawn, more than half of it runs off. Where does it go? It goes into our waterways. Goes downstream, goes into the ocean. Algae blooms. There's so many imbalances that take place with all the fertilizer runoff that we use. Compost is food for your lawns, for your flower beds. Great compost is great to top dress your container plants. You can mix the compost in with your potting soil, or you can just top dress your containers with you know, half an inch of compost, indoor or outdoor containers. And the food will go into the soil and it'll feed the plants, goods for them. So does anyone have questions at this point? I do, and it's funny that you have that. You said hair from your hairbrush. What about dog hair? Absolutely. Absolutely. When I vacuum, my, I... Tumbleweeds? I could <laughs> exactly. <laughs> exactly. I, I always say I could knit a dog. Yes, yes, absolutely. Pet hair is perfect for the, gar for the uh, compost pile. Uh, if you have uh, any kind of pet rodents or pet birds, any of their bedding is perfectly good for the compost pile. Do not put litter box contents or dog <clears throat> droppings in the compost. You don't want to put fecal matter from any kind of non-vegetarian animal in the compost. Because the vegetarian animals, the rodents, the birds, etc., their fecal matter won't contain disease pathogens that are transferable to humans. If it's, if it's a meat eater. Rabbits are perfect. Rabbits are perfect. Yeah, that, that would be perfectly fine. Yes? Horse manure is perfectly good. Horse manure is highly, yeah, yeah, absolutely. It's a very valid question. With any kind of a manure, whether it's bird doodle, horse manure, anything, the volume is gonna be significant because it's really highly nitrogenous. All right, so if you put horse manure in, you wanna make sure you're putting a lot of wood shavings, uh, sawdust, that really carboniferous material. So it, there's got to be a lot of balance there. A lot of times the, um, the bedding from the horse barn will counteract things a good deal, but it's, it's going to take a little bit of fiddling with it. But if you use the bedding, that has urine in it. And the same stuff that you get out of the paddock that doesn't have any, any urine in it. It, if it has urine in it, that too is going to have a lot of nitrogen. 
Yeah, yeah, so it's all gonna have to be taken into account. And you know, with, with any of these things, it's not gonna be an exact science. You know, if, if you want to get the Rodale book or get the Stu Campbell book and you know, look at all the, how much nitrogen, what the ratios are, you can sit down with your pencil and paper and figure things out, or you can just go out and say, wow, that's not rotting at all, it needs more nitrogen, or wow, that's really slimy, it needs more carbon and just keep tweaking things that way. And I mean, let's be honest, whenever we have an animal, especially an animal of that size, one day to the next, one week to the next, things are gonna shift. So we just keep playing with it a little bit. I mean, the old farmers, if they had a cow that keeled over dead, well, you're not gonna use her meat. What are you gonna do with the body? You put her in the manure pile. You got nitrogen added to the nitrogen at this point. It's already a manure pile. It's going to stink to high heaven. It's all going to rot eventually. You know, that was the farm. They were not gravely concerned about the odiferosity. <laughs> but you know, nowadays we have to live in Simsbury. We have to live in Brookfield. We have to live with neighbors who are slightly more concerned with odiferosity. We also have bears, we have the neighborhood dogs, we have us, you know, chickens. You know, we have all sorts of things that we have to take into account nowadays that the old farmers didn't have to worry about. So if there's a few things on the handout here that uh, you'll have information on things that you can put in the compost pile, things to avoid with the compost pile. Um, you know, so some of the things are no-brainers, things that don't decompose. Don't put your plastic in there. You know, if you want to do an experiment like I did, you know, that's one thing. But in general, use your common sense, you know. No styrofoam. No styrofoam, exactly, exactly. You know, we've, there are those packing materials that are, they look like packing peanuts, but you can run them under water. Mm -hmm. Put those in, why not? Regular styrofoam, not so much. Yes? What do you think of the uh, red worm composting? The, the in, indoor composting? The, you can do it outdoors yeah, too, the but then they will die in the wintertime. Yeah, in the wintertime. They, those are red wrigglers, mm -hmm. the vermicomposting. I think that is a really cool thing. It's, that's definitely something that people need to be more active with. You know, usually those bin systems, they can put them, you know, just down in the cellar or even under the kitchen sink if they want a small enough uh, operation. But vermicomposting, I actually have a couple of my fellow master gardeners uh, out of the Bethel office that are really into the vermicomposting. And uh, in fact, I think something like yankeeworms.org or something like that is one of the girls' websites. And it's especially cool if you have kids because they can really learn a lot about the composting, but it's something where you have to really be monitoring uh, the paper that you put in, the uh, amount of organic matter that you put in, the moisture level of all the, the different things. But yeah, there can be some really cool stuff with the vermicomposting. Any other questions? Yes? Well, we don't have porcupines in my area. Um, the dog does have a certain amount of interest in it, but once she decides that there's really nothing delicious there, she just moves on. Occasionally, the corn cobs will take a walk. You know, look, Mama, I've got a corn cob. <laughs> I, fortunately, so far, we haven't had bear in my area, but to my way of thinking, the advantage of the open composting is They'll just take what they want and leave the rest and not destroy anything in the process. Um, because it's all vegetable matter, and most of it is rotting vegetable matter, it's going to be minimally interesting to them. Um, but yeah, there's always the possibility that there will be critters. Uh, as, as long as we're steering clear of putting any meats, any oils, uh, dairy, into the compost pile, we're gonna have much less of a likelihood of attracting the critters. 
But you know, bears are always a wild card. You know, they're, they're, they're uh, only minimally predictable, uh, as Allison can tell you. <laughs> the goddess of bears, yes. It can be problematic. The rule of thumb has always been that if you have a cold composting operation like I have, that you should never put anything in it that has gone to seed. Now, there has been some new studies on that that show that while in a hot compost, the weed seeds are killed by the heat, the study found that in a cold compost, the weeds will have sprouted and then been killed. So the net effect is allegedly the same. I myself avoid putting weed seeds in there just so I don't tempt fate. But, you know, it's worth monkeying around with. I'm not fond of perpetuating the weed the seeds. The only time I used horse manure as a fertilizer, mm -hmm. composting it, I had such weeds that took me years to get rid of. I mean, some, some of them were like per se, I mean, I apparently mm. eaten out of my wine too, but some of these things I was pulling up for years and years. I can believe that. That, that is one of the, the wild cards with horse manure because horses, and I don't know all the proper terminology for it, cow manure, because they have the three stomachs, the seeds will get digested and they don't come out the other end with horses. Yes, what goes in is a lot similar to what comes out. So there's a lot of seeds that pass right through the horse's digestive tract. So it's, it's good to, when we're using horse manure, to get it well composted or at least well aged before we use it in the garden. Composting something in your water? Uh, eventually it'll be composted. Right now it's still peppermint. Oh, good. <laughs> so do they rooting it? Or? Well, maybe that too. It doesn't seem to have rooted just yet. <laughs> Any other questions? Bless you. Don't hold that in. <laughs> well, I appreciate you letting me come and visit. And if you have more questions, let me know. Funding for Simsbury Community Television is provided in part by contributions from viewers like you. Thank you.